And all right, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and Proverbs chapter 29. Ephesians chapter 5 and Proverbs chapter 29. You might think that this is a little bit of a different type of a sermon for a conference, but we are living in unusual times. We're living in a very crucial and critical area, uh, era. I have never in my Christian life been more inspired, convicted, and stirred to preach for our country, the United States of America. Amen. This has been some year. Amen. It started out normal. Amen. We were in Prescott Conference. Pastor Mitchell preached Monday and Friday night, as he always does. We went home from conference, all good. And then we were struck with COVID, and within a week, everything changed. Look at how we're living our lives now. And then George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis and began the season of rioting and destruction and the burning down of our cities that is still happening tonight. And then we're in a presidential election year with Donald Trump, and that's always going to be interesting. Amen. And then, of course, Pastor Mitchell went to be with Jesus. I mean, what a year. Never has there been a year like this in my Christian experience. First Timothy 2 is really a political statement, in a way, spiritual and political. Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. What an interesting statement that he's uh, challenging us to preach for political leaders. Men who are not saved, generally speaking. Many of them who haven't been towards sin even. But he's asking prayer because of how influential people in authority are and how much they contribute to, to the spiritual climate of a nation. I feel compelled more than ever to pray for our country on a number of levels. You might think this is a very weird question to ask in the middle of a conference. Are you going to vote? How much thought have you given to that? And do you realize how much is riding on the outcome of this election? I don't believe that there is an option this year with all that is at stake. There have been 11 presidential elections since my wife and I were born again, 11 of them, starting with Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford, all the way up until this one. I don't believe that indifference in this regard is an option. I don't believe that not participating is an option. You know the familiar quote, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men, good people to do nothing. You and I have opportunity to wield influence through prayer. It is spiritual, but we also have, I believe, a spiritual obligation to wield influence as we are able to in whatever form, and it happens to land in a little less than a month in the action or the activity of voting. I think we're on a precipice right now in the history of our country. Amen. We're either going to go on or we're going to go off. Amen. The old adage is don't apply anymore. 
You remember the old adage my father used to tell me, Democrats are for the poor, Republicans are only for the rich. They're still trying to push that, but today there's a lot more at stake than just that. Amen. Do you know the last election, 2016, between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, hung on about 70,000 votes in three counties. Voting matters. Amen. Macomb County in, in Michigan, York County in Pennsylvania, and Waukesha County in Milwaukee, in uh, the Milwaukee area of Wisconsin. Those three counties elected Donald Trump. If Trump would have lost those three counties, uh, he would have lost the election. That's how razor thin the margins were. According to the Washington-based Freedom House, 86 countries in the world are considered free based on their political rights and civil liberties. They enjoy some modicum of freedom, maybe not to the degree that we do, but some measure of freedom. They're called free countries. 50 countries in the world have no freedom. You don't understand that. You get up in the morning, you go to your car, you go to work, you go to the restaurants, uh, you meet people for coffee. You co we have such freedoms. Fifty countries have none of those freedoms. Amen. And then 59 countries, uh, they say, have partial freedom. 2.6 billion people in the world live with none of the freedoms that we enjoy. Do we value those freedoms? Those freedoms have given us uh, the opportunity to raise money and preach the gospel around the world. We can come and go. We can travel. Uh, we can go into nations. We can get visas uh, and get residency uh, and live and preach the gospel. This election is critical. And we need to be praying about what we need to do. Look at the freedoms we've lost in just the last six, seven months because of coronavirus. I don't think it's too extreme to say that this is all a test run for the power grab that some are after with this election and beyond. Our nation has been founded on Judeo-Christian ethic and morality and freedom. Come on. Limited government so as to allow people to pursue their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations. All of those things are at risk. Amen. A lot is weighing in the balance. We have a responsibility. And I want to preach a sermon that I've entitled A Biblical View of Political Issues. For those of you that are prone to get ticked off at sermons like this, uh, I hope you do. But my objective is to challenge you, motivate you, clarify for you what we're dealing with. Because in a lot of ways, you know, half the country doesn't even vote. Amen. There's a lot of indifference, uh, and unfortunately, some of that indifference is in the church. Well, so let me read these two scriptures to you, and we're going to travel down this road of giving you a biblical view of political issues. Oh. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Amen. And then Ephesians 5, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for grace. Thank you for this incredible conference, this great congregation all that you're doing and all that's represented here, the many nations, the incredible influence that this church wields around the world. Lord, I pray for special anointing to minister this word, to motivate us uh, to influence for God. In Jesus' name I pray. So let me take a moment and let's examine the landscape for a moment. No right-thinking person can deny that we here in the United States of America are in a very serious moral decline. Amen. 
And there's nothing new here, but it needs to be recognized. Amen. And the reason is that many people will not recognize it. We just simply go about our business and go about our lives. And a lot of things that are happening in the world today don't seem to wield impact and wield influence in our personal lives. Many, as a matter of fact, will define moral decline as normal. Hello? Divorce, normal. Abandoning children, normal. Chaos, crime, murder, violence, uh, burning cities down. It's all become normal today and we're supposed to accept it. Amen. Come on. A lot of people view, view it as growth or developing or evolving. It's called being progressive. What was once decried as abjectly immoral, unbiblical, and destructive is now celebrated. Come on, preach. And the Bible warns about this. Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. He's prophesying about a generation that is going to come, that is going to look at what God abhors, and they're going to be celebrating it. There are seasons where righteousness has opportunity. Amen. Where morality is upheld. Come on. And there are other times when decline occurs. Second Chronicles 28, 19. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. Get a hold of that. He was the cause. One man in leadership was the cause of moral decline. His debauchery, immorality, idolatry, and godlessness caused a spiritual dimension to seize hold of the entire nation. For King Ahaz encouraged moral decline in Judah and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. So here's a secular king. It's not a prophet, not a priest. He's a secular king. And by his conduct, by his behavior, by his philosophy of life, by his self-indulgence and his godless lifestyle, the entire nation declines. That's what many political leaders are advocating today, moral decline. Judges. Various institutions have been doing this for the last 60 or 70 years. Hollywood has led the charge uh, and it has encroached uh, into our educational system uh, and the media. And a lot of what kids are up to on their devices uh, is uh, initiating a moral decline in much of the youth in our own churches. And this, of course, is reflected in the political arena today. Amen. There are spiritual dynamics involved in this upcoming election. Amen. Come on. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. In the United States of America, through our vote, we put people in authority. What kind of people are they? Amen. And what is going to be the result uh, or the consequences uh, of the position that we put them in? It's not a perfect system. It's not without fault. But there are policies uh, that are embedded in our political parties uh, that will determine to some degree the course of our nation and the spiritual dimension that hovers over our country. Because elections uh, have consequences. We hear that all the time. But elections also affect the spiritual realm. Amen. The text that we read, both of them are about consequences. When the righteous are in authority, people rejoice. It creates an atmosphere. When someone has a biblical world view, they reference God's word. 
They have a morality that reflects how God is. It doesn't make a perfect world, and it doesn't mean that that person in authority is perfect because there's still sin, there's still unrighteousness, there's still powerful forces that will always be at work, but it has impact, and it causes people to rejoice, and it causes a celebratory atmosphere, and I believe that it creates an, an environment that makes the preaching of the gospel, the raising of money for missions and for evangelism much easier, and there's a greater measure, a greater dimension, less opposition, and a greater flow to it. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. Been a lot of groaning in our country in the last generation. When wicked men have ruled. Amen. It's a cause for grief. It imposes a frustration in the atmosphere. And in our country, unlike many nations of the world, we determine this. With our vote, we are going to contribute to one atmosphere or the other. One of rejoicing or one of groaning. One of ongoing freedom and blessing or one of loss of freedom and frustration. So I want to talk to you tonight. These aren't all the issues. I've left some very pertinent ones out uh, for time's sake, even though your pastor told me don't worry about time. That's very dangerous to tell me that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> pastor Mitchell used to harangue me for my nine minute long introductions to sermons. He said, if you can't introduce a sermon in about 30 seconds, there's something wrong with your preaching style. <laughs> I uh, officiated over the graveside part of the homegoing celebration for Pastor Mitchell, and I thought, maybe I'll just do a nine-minute introduction now, and he can't say nothing. <laughs> I have five issues of concern that I want to talk to you about and help you perhaps to formulate opinions. A lot of times believers uh, don't know how to formulate an opinion or an attitude or a perspective about something. Issues that have a moral component are the ones that I'm concerned about. Issues that have a moral component. The first issue is socialism versus capitalism. The Bible takes a very strong stance uh, against uh, socialism. And according to Barna's research, 50% of young evangelicals uh, say that they prefer socialism over capitalism. So I hope that if you're here, this upsets you a little bit. Socialism is a political and economic theory of social organization which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be regulated or owned by the community as a whole. You hear terms like redistribution of wealth. That can occur because someone other than you has a say-so about what's to be done with your money that you earn. That's unbiblical. Income inequality, we hear about that. You're only allowed to earn so much. And if somebody earns less than you, that's wrong. That's evil. That's demonic. Wealth has to be taken from one, given to the other, as a means to make things even. Let me illustrate it this way. And it may not be a perfect illustration, but I think the simplicity of it will help us understand uh, the dynamics that are involved here. Let's say there are 10 families, uh, and all of them have a house, uh, and they all own the same amount of acreage and property. They are farmers. They all have access to water, to seed. They all have the implements that they need to farm. And eight of these are hardworking and they're, they're, they're ingenious and they figure out how best to fertilize, how best to water. They experiment. They are into being farmers and they're trying to learn how to be more fruitful. And they live and breathe farming and they prosper. They have bumper crops and they're very, very prosperous. 
But two of those ten families, two of those ten farmers are lazy. They don't work at their craft. They don't make an effort to, to learn. They're lazy. Their fields are overgrown with weeds. They plant and graze just enough to barely survive. In a socialist system, you're supposed to have empathy and sympathy for the two lazy families and the inequality of income is supposed to be evil or wrong. And so we take from the eight to give to the two to make things even. So as to fix the evil of income equality by the redistribution of wealth. Capitalism is about work. It's about work and profit and applying yourself, getting educated. Think of the potential that all of you have, the function of your brain and your mind, the ingeniousness and the ingenuity of human beings to envision, to have a, 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 a vision for the future, to want to become a doctor. Little boys desire to become architects and builders and doctors and police officers. And then they grow up and they apply the themselves to that. There's a powerful dimension at work in human beings. There's unimmeasurable un potential inside of a human being. And you're supposed to apply yourself. And then you get to reap the reward and the benefit. Yes, there are those who cannot do for themselves. We help them. We serve them. There are taxes. We need to build roads and bridges and airports and so forth. And so we allow for a an amount of our wealth uh, to be taken uh, and put into areas where there is legitimate need. Uh, but the vast majority of wealth uh, is to be controlled uh, by the individual. You should get nothing unless you work for it and earn it. Amen. Work is good. You ought to try it sometime. God has given everybody the ability to get wealth. That's what Deuteronomy 8.18 is all about. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers. That's a powerful statement. Power to get wealth, ability, skill, talent, vision inventiveness, entrepreneurship. He's given you power to figure life out and apply yourself in some way to acquire and accumulate wealth. One of the great testimonies of our churches is young men that get saved. I had a young, my door director as a matter of fact, what do I need a job for? I live with my mother. That's how he was when he gave his life to Christ. Uh, and any, mother than I, any money, money that I can accumulate, I can run off and go party with it. And mommy will give me more money uh, and continue to do my laundry. No, in life, you've got to make your own way. It's called having a work ethic. You cannot allow yourself, you cannot allow someone, rather, to do for you what you should be doing for yourself. So, mother, quit doing the laundry of your 30-year-old son. <laughs> quit providing him with shelter and paying his way. You're paying his tickets, his fines, his warrants. Uh, knock it off. Let him grow up. <laughs> Second Thessalonians 3.10, for even when we were with you, we, communica uh, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you disorderly, not working at all, busybodies. Now those who are such, uh, we command and exhort through the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. 
The word there means to make gains, to work. It means to make gains by trading, doing business, to, to produce, to earn, to acquire by your own labor. And the Bible says God's going to judge you for this. Revelation chapter 22, and behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Amen. This is part of accountability, work. Did you use uh, the faculties that God gave you, the mind, the brain, uh, the hands, the skill, uh, the, the, the genius that God created you? Did you put it to use uh, for your benefit and your family and those around you in the church? The second political issue that has a moral component that we need to pay attention to is freedom of speech versus suppression of free speech. If you're paying half attention to what's going on today, you know what is happening. There is an effort, and it's more than just an effort. There is legislation in several dozens of our state to try to silence us from saying what we believe. Mark that down. A lot of what we say has been labeled hate speech. It has already been criminalized in some countries. A, a pastor spent time in prison in Sweden for preaching a sermon on homosexuality. And it's coming to America and it is already here and it's going to accelerate if we're not very careful. Amen. It's an effort to silence and to shut down the church. Why is the church such a major feature in the news today with coronavirus? Why isn't Walmart? Oh, I know what it is. I, I, I got it. Coronavirus only goes to church. <laughs> You can go to Walmart, you can go to Walmart. I have people, Pastor, I can't come to church, coronavirus. But they just got back from Walmart, just went to a restaurant. One of the greatest destructive forces at work today when it comes to free speech is the internet. Amen. A few people control the messages that get out there. Amen. A few people control the messages that get out there. Amen. There was a recent documentary made on Israel that had a, had a spiritual kind of a component to it. There were recent educational videos, I think there were kind of cartoon type of videos made about the Ten Commandments, trying to teach children about that. And they put these two videos, uh, or these series of videos, on the restricted list on YouTube, uh, which is the same category as pornography, which prevents them from being shown in schools. So you take free speech for granted. But it's not always going to be here if we're not very careful. Amen. Dennis Prager, a Christian commentator and author, Ben Shapiro, many of you know who he is, uh, are put on the, in the same category as Nazis, uh, and their speech is censored uh, on some uh, uh, internet platforms. And there's nothing new here, folks. Acts chapter 4, verse 17. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak no more in this name. Amen. Come on. And then they responded, the disciples said, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. We're going to continue to preach. Amen. Amen. Whatever price we have to pay in order to do that, and now, Amen. or up until this time, there hasn't been a price to pay for preaching Come on. for the most part. There's some reproach, of course. We understand that. Being a Christian brings a reproach. You know, you can blaspheme God today on the airwaves. You can shut down churches, arrest preachers. 
But you can preach a biblically based sermon uh, on sin or homosexuality or the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way and every other religion is false. And if you believe them, they'll take you to hell. Come on. The third issue that has a moral component is law and order versus lawlessness and anarchy. Oh, come on. At the beginning of this year, nobody would have believed what we're seeing in our country today. I am all for peaceful protests. Let's get out in the street and have a peaceful protest and preach the gospel. Amen. But a lot of what we are seeing is not that, although it's being called that. The night after rioting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, my grandson and I drove through the city. It was still smoldering. Wow. Businesses were completely destroyed. Families uh, were out in front of their cities trying to go through the debris. Some of the buildings that were still smoldering from the rioting the night before. And we were able to drive through the city. I was quite surprised. Uh, we didn't see one police officer. Not one. Burned out buildings, broken windows, people were boarding up their businesses that hadn't yet been destroyed. This is the United States of America, and this lawlessness and this anarchy is being allowed, I think, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, they're in their 130th or something a day of rioting every single night. Historically, People have been right to take to the streets to stand against injustice. I would call Jesus' procession into Jerusalem as a peaceful march. Right? Palm Sunday, uh, the donkey, uh, he gets on it and people begin to worship him. Uh, that peaceful march uh, gave people an opportunity uh, to worship him as Lord uh, and it sent a very strong message uh, in defiance of the religious ruling hierarchy. Martin Luther King said, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Uh, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. That doesn't sound like what's happening today, Dr. King. We're seeing an unprecedented increase in violent crime in major cities. We've never seen increases to this degree. Just in the last year alone, 100% increase in shootings in New York City and a 50% increase in murders. Open warfare in our streets. Amen. It's not uncommon to hear 70, 80, 90 shootings in Chicago with 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 people killed. I'm glad that we have our own Al Capone, wherever he is, preaching in Chicago. I, I say that with affection, but I couldn't help. You are Chicago, bro. <laughs> this election season, you need to listen to those who are speaking the language of law and order versus anarchy and disorder. The only way that we have seen the level of rioting is because it's being allowed. It can be stopped. Luke 21. Jesus spoke about this in his uh, uh, chapter in Luke on what's going to be happening in the last days when you hear of wars uh, and commotions. That word commotion uh, means a state of disorder, instability, confusion, tumult, and disturbance. Uh, he said, when you see commotions, don't be terrified, uh, for these things must come to pass first, uh, but the end will not come immediately. Martin Luther King said, the limitation of riots moral questions aside, is that they cannot win, and their participants know it. Hence, rioting is not revolutionary, but reactionary, because it invites defeat. It involves an emotional catharsis, but it must be followed uh, by a sense of futility. I wish more people were listening to him today. Amen. 
than just naming streets after him. And the fourth, I have four, not five. The fourth moral issue is abortion versus right to life. Come on. Come on. Proverbs 6 tells us seven things the Lord hates. Proverbs 6, 16, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. You can't get more innocent than a baby in the womb. A heart that devises wicked plans. The plot to abort a baby is a wicked plan. Amen. Feet that are swift running to evil. The urgency with which people advocate for and get abortions is the equivalent of running to evil. Amen. So three out of the seven things that the Lord hates have to do with the evil of abortion. Amen. Your right to choose does not include murder. Amen. Amen. The 1973 Supreme Court ruling that made abortion legal, the foundation of that, the basis for their rationale or for the majority rationale that uh, was that they decided that a baby in the womb is not a person. Therefore, it can be flushed. Since Roe v. Wade, there have been 62 million abortions. That's 25,000 a week, 3,000 a day. Don't criticize the Nazis for the Holocaust. Today's culture of abortion is worse. Amen. The womb of a mother should be the safest place for a baby. It's now a killing field. Come on, preach. Come on. Wow. Saying that a baby in the womb is not a person is a lie. Amen. At six weeks, a baby has functioning eyes, lungs, heartbeat, brain waves. Come on. And that baby now has a unique DNA. The DNA of a baby comes from the DNA of a mother and the DNA of a father. But by this time, the DNA is his or her identity. Amen. The mother is supposed to be a host, not an executioner. Amen. The doctor is supposed to be a guide to protect life not join in a conspiracy to murder. At 20 weeks, a baby can feel pain in the womb. Amen. Various abortion techniques are very painful for the baby. It is killing in a very brutal and a very violent way. Saline poisoning and dismemberment and suction procedures take place within a woman's womb in order to destroy a baby's life. Carol Everett in her book, The Scarlet Lady, Confessions of an Abortionist, had an epiphany. She saw the evil of abortion and she finally got it after having done thousands in opening clinics. She writes this in her book, I went to check out the operating room to be sure it was ready. Instruments had to be prepared and sterilized. The tube had to be inserted into the uterus and forceps to remove the pieces of the unwanted baby. After the anesthesia had put Jenny to sleep, I placed my hand on her abdomen and I felt the movement of the baby. The doctor began suctioning the baby no, and the baby no longer moved. The next step required the baby to be removed piece by piece using the forceps. That's abortion. Now let me say here, and I have to say this in my church and wherever I preach sermons like this, that there are women here that you have had abortions. God can forgive you and has forgiven you. And you can live absent of the guilt of having done that. 
I know people very, very close to me, women that have had abortions uh, and the power that's in the blood of Jesus uh, removes the stain and the curse and the sin. Abby Johnson spoke at the Republican National Convention. She once worked for Planned Parenthood and was one of the senior members of that organization. She participated, according to her testimony, in thousands of abortions. One day she was asked to participate in an ultrasound guided abortion. And she writes in her book, nothing prepared me for what I saw on the screen. The unborn baby was fighting back desperate to move away from the suction and I'll never forget what I saw next the baby's spine twirling around just before the suction pulled it out I know what abortion sounds like I know what abortion feels like I know what abortion smells like did you know that abortion has a smell Planned Parenthood sells baby parts that was discovered in the last few years your taxpayer money goes to support Planned Parenthood. And the lie, of course, is that this is a harmless medical procedure. It's a reasonable solution for an unwanted pregnancy. No, according to the word of God, it's death to a living soul. Amen. Jesus came to give life. And that more abundantly. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you. That I have said before you life and death. Blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life. That both of you. Both you and your descendants may live. This innocent blood. And all innocent blood. Cries out for vengeance. John 10.10 10 says the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The abortionist is an advocate for what Satan wants to accomplish, a, a destroyer of life. Life that's created in the image and the likeness of Almighty God. Life that has the attributes of God. Life that has a dimension of genius uh, embedded in his DNA structure or hers uh, that flows from God himself. Uh, the Bible says that God breathed uh, and Adam became a living soul in every baby, in every human being. Uh, there is the breath of God that gives life. Amen. The attack on children, of course, is nothing new. Satan attacks children. When he wants to destroy a nation and a destiny. Amen. We have the accounts of Pharaoh and Herod. I don't need to recount those. Pharaoh trying to kill all the ma uh, male babies born uh, while the children of Israel were in captivity in Egypt. And Herod uh, who tried to kill the king of Israel that was prophesied in the Bible. Exodus 21, 22, if men fight and hurt a woman with a child so that she gives birth prematurely and yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according to the woman's husband as he imposes on him and he shall pay as the judge determines. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. 62 million abortions in 47 years. America's children are under attack. They're under attack in the womb. They're under attack in our streets as gangs and drug dealers try to approach them at the earliest possible age to influence. They're under attack in our schools through the model of secular humanistic education. One college professor I read about in Ohio threatened to dismiss any student in his class that was pro-life. How long before God takes vengeance, life for life? America owes a debt of 62 million lives, and that is going to be rectified at a time of God's choosing. Amen. It's coming. Amen. Isaiah, listen, O coastlands, to me and take heed. You people from afar, the Lord has called me from the womb. 
from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back uh, to him so that Israel is gathered to him. There's something sacred incubating in the womb of every mother. Jeremiah says, before I formed you in the womb, says the Lord, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Remember when Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist? Luke 1, 14, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. And then when Mary came to visit her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb. The baby felt the presence of God and leapt in her womb and was filled with the Holy Ghost. Only people can get filled with the Holy Ghost. Genesis 25. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said, two nations are in your womb. Not a person, you say. Not a human being created in the image and light. Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. There's destiny in her womb. Flash forward to this year, 2020. Uh, we are told uh, that not wearing a mask is putting people at risk uh, and yet we can abort babies all day long. Amen. Governor Cuomo of New York made a speech at a women's conference and received a standing ovation when he advocated third trimester abortion. I know black lives matter. I know all lives matter. I know blue lives matter. I know brown lives matter. Unborn lives matter too. Ronald Reagan said the nation that kills its unborn children has lost its soul. So what is required here, beloved, is some prayerful consideration about what we're going to do. We're going to continue to live for God, preach the gospel, make disciples, plant churches. But are you going to vote? So what would God expect? Having this opportunity, what is a Christian and a believer to do in this particular political and moral climate? I believe that we're called to vote biblically. Amen. This means that our vote to the best of its ability reflects our faith. So what we can we do? We can stop voting for people that are pro-abortion and lawless and antichrist and stop sending them to Washington. That's what we can do. <laughs> president Trump was the first president to speak at the annual pro-life rally in Washington. Amen. That surprised me a little bit because we've had other pro-life presidents, uh, but they thought it was too politically risky to speak at the pro-life rally. Amen. Political persons, political parties are not perfect. They're secular institutions, but they do reflect philosophy and morality and policy. Amen. And in some cases, a spiritual dimension or lack of it. And I think we have clearly defined directions to go godlessness or biblical Christianity. Both are evident in today's political arena. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. We're going to determine that. I want you to bow your head with me. Thank you. I went a little bit long, as Joe Campbell encouraged me to do, but <laughs> you can talk to him. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm so thankful for our fellowship. We can preach whatever's on our heart to preach. We don't have to worry about political correctness. 
while some of our messages and sermons may make some upset, it's for the good. We hope you can repent, get your heart right, turn from wickedness and sin. The first time I heard Pastor Warner preach, I didn't get saved. He made me mad. My wife got saved, not me. So that's going to occur. We can't help that. It's the nature of the message. It's what happens when your sin is challenged. I so appreciated our sister, been saved a little over a year, testifying. We need 100,000 more just like that. Opiates are killing a whole generation. I look out at this audience and I see a lot of people that are still troubled and tormented and vexed. There's the arms of Jesus that we can always run to. We need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what satisfies the soul. That's what fills the heart with peace and joy. That's first and foremost. What I'm talking about tonight is in addition to that, of course, the most important feature of life. And whatever the outcome of the election, we still serve Jesus, live for God. We still have victory, power, authority, and dominion. And perhaps you're here tonight or you're listening to me live stream and you're not saved, you're not right with God. You've never had the experience of having your sins forgiven. But you really want to know what that's all about. You're tired of living the way you've lived. Maybe you were moved by our sister's testimony tonight. Just a short time ago, oh deed. Out of misery, oppression, anxiety, depression, Over half of people today acknowledge depression and anxiety, opiates, drugs, prescription drugs even, doctors writing them by the thousands and millions upon billions of dollar industry now, trying to medicate people to some measure of peace, but they don't find peace. Peace is only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ because he alone can forgive your sin. So as our heads are bowed, perhaps you're here this morning and you're not right with God, but you want to get right with him. Perhaps you're in the live stream audience and there's sin in your life and you want to repent and you want to get your heart right with God. I want to ask you if you would allow me to pray for you. And in order to do so, I want you to do one thing first. I want you to acknowledge before God that you want prayer, you're ready to give your life to Jesus, and I'd like you to do that by lifting your hand. In this audience right in front of me here in person or live streaming, I want you to lift your hand high so that I can see it. God bless you, I see that hand. Is there anyone else? You can put it down. God bless you, I see that, thank you. Anyone else, lift your hand right up and put it right back down, and I feel in my spirit there are people live streaming that, are, that God's dealing with me. You're not saved. You're not right with God. You're not living clean. If you would slip into eternity now, you're not ready. You haven't taken care of business uh, and you need to lift your hand right now all over this building in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're backslidden. We're living in a very sinful, wicked, evil world with sinful opportunity at every hand. At the click of a mouse, uh, you can open a window to pornography and perversion. Uh, you can connect with people you shouldn't be connecting with and involve yourself uh, in things you shouldn't be involved with. And it's destroying the cutting edge uh, of people's spiritual life. And they end up backsliding because they develop such an appetite for sin through the media and the Internet and the social media. You're not right with God. You're backslidden. You need to take this opportunity right now to rededicate. This is no time to be backslidden. Jesus is coming at any moment. We're living in a critical hour. We need to be living for God. Don't risk hell for eternity because you're upset or you're mad or you're vexed or you're frustrated. You have no excuse not to be living for God and serving Jesus with all your heart. Lift your hand right now. Make a decision. God bless you, sir. I see that. Anyone else? Lift your hand right up all over this auditorium. All, God bless you, brother. I see that hand all over our live stream audience. All right, if you raise your hand, I need you to get out of your seat. If you haven't raised it yet, I need you to get out of your seat. Come forward. Someone's going to find you and pray for you right now. I want you to come right now. You raise your hand. I want you to come. Find a place to pray. I need some brethren to come and pray with these. Someone's coming to pray with our brother right here on my left. God bless you. Just kneel down right there. Thank you. 
Amen. I need a sister to come right here quickly. Come and pray with these very quickly. And you pray a sinner's prayer with them. I don't care if you know them or don't know them. They raise their hand to either give their lives to Christ and repent or rededicate their lives to Jesus. I need a, another sister to come and pray here. Amen. Make sure someone's praying with everyone. Brother right here. Thank you. You lead them in a prayer. Oh, God, we're living in such a critical hour. This is not a time for compromise, not a time for apathy and indifference. It's a time to wield influence in every way we can. We pray, we witness, we share our faith, we preach the gospel, and in this political season, we're going to vote. I feel an obligation. I believe God's going to hold me accountable. What did you do? When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, they groan. And the other scripture, I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even refer to it, but the other scripture that I read, be circumspect because the days are evil. That means look around you. Pay attention to what is going on. Educate yourself. Figure out a way to live your life so that you can wield the most impact and influence. Oh, God, we need revival in our nation. I feel more inspired than I ever have to pray for our president, our vice president, our institutions. I'm praying for revival throughout our land, in every church of our fellowship throughout the country. Oh, God, breathe life, breathe revival over our nation. Protect our freedoms. Help us, oh God, to push back uh, on the moral decline that has such a stranglehold on our culture. We are the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be influential and push back. Let's all stand. I think we need to find a place to pray. Let's cry out to God. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and then I will heal the land. Our land needs a lot of healing right now and we can initiate that. I want you to turn at your seat, get at the altar, turn at the aisle and begin to cry out to God. God. Let's lay hold of God tonight in Jesus' name. God, I give you praise. I glorify and worship your name. Cry out to God. Oh, God, heal our land, Lord. Pour out your spirit, oh God. Visit us, oh Lord, with a mighty visitation for you. Have promised to pour out your spirit in the last days upon all flesh, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh God, we lay claim to that prophecy and that revival in in the name of Jesus, visit us with a mighty Holy Ghost visitation, O God. God, hallelujah, push back on the tide of evil and wickedness and moral decline and give us opportunity, O Lord. Hallelujah. Oh God, I praise you, I need you, I love you, I exalt you, I glorify you. Stir the hearts of our pastors and their wives, oh God. Stir the hearts of our youth, fill us afresh with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, oh God, only 
you, Lord, are the answer for our nation. Father, turn the tide of every lying voice, every expression of wickedness, O God. Their evil plans shall be silenced, O Lord. I want us all to stand tonight and I want us to lift our hands and I want us to cry out to Almighty God in unison together in our own way with our own voice and I want us to shake the portals of heaven. I know that your pastor preached on the power of the Holy Ghost on Monday. Let's pray for another visitation, another outpouring to energize and stir our hearts that will bear fruit and wield influence in our nation. you to bow your heads and I want to just pray right now. Father, I pray for every woman that's here that 
may have had an abortion, Lord God, I pray for grace over their lives right now. Break the curse of guilt and condemnation. Set them free from the spirit of murder and taking that life, Lord. And I pray the peace of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of Almighty God, the power that's in the blood of Jesus forgives every sin when there's repentance, Lord. And I pray comfort and grace and strength and help and favor over these right now, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. We have our marching orders as believers. Apart from the election that I spoke about, we have our marching orders. Live for God, serve Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. You're going to go back to your cities at the end of conference uh, and you're going to continue doing. You may have come discouraged and wounded and broken and crushed and wanting to give up, but you're going to be energized during this conference and you're going to go back to your city, nation, wielding more influence than ever before. And uh, we are, however, also in a political season. I believe that's a part of our responsibility. We have to put people in authority. Amen. And let's do that righteously with integrity. Let's give God praise as our brother comes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, think about what's been spoken. Uh, you have an obligation as a Christian to vote biblically. You have an obligation as a Christian to vote biblically. I understand, not perfect, all those things, but how can you, if you have a choice between a, one that believes in life and one that believes in abortion, one that believes in the nuclear family, biblical family, one that believes in homosexuality, perversion, and the list goes on and on, one that's pro-Israel. Move the embassy to Jerusalem. The other four previous presidents all talked about it, but none of them did it. Yeah, think about things in life. You think about socialism, redistribution of wealth. Jesus said the man with one talent because he didn't do it, he took it and gave it to the man who had the most money. <laughs> Think about your Bible. Don't get caught up in all the foolishness. Got to have a brain of your own. Praise the Lord. Amen. Very excellent message. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. And so uh, tomorrow, would you give God praise?